1989, the Model T Ford was elected as the best car of the century. As they say, it was the car that put America on wheels. The Model T is one of the most significant technological devices of the 20th century. First of all, it was a revolutionary device because it did what could only be done once. It made people want automobiles, and it was inexpensive enough that they could not only want to buy it, they were actually able to buy it. At one point, over half the cars in the world were Model T Fords. It's possible that it would have happened either way, but this time it was clearly due to Joe Gallamb and Henry Ford that the automobile actually became part of everyday life. Joe Gallamb was one of the people working on a drawing board, drawing new parts and things, but he'd been trained in Europe, and the style of drawing that he did was different from the American style. It was a more expressive, more visually attractive style. And Henry Ford saw that and was drawn to it. And he asked, Who's, who made this drawing? Well, the fellow over there. That Dutch guy over there. So someone from Holland, because they didn't know where Gollum had actually come from. And after that, Ford called Joe Gollum, and they had that famous conversation, beginning with, Joe, I've got an idea. And from then on, he was would always gravitate to, to Joe's Drawing board. What Gollum and his people created was much more than just the people's car. It was reliable, could be used on unpaved roads, and was easy to repair. Even the local blacksmith could fix most of the problems. Ford said that he wanted to put America on wheels, but actually he put the whole world on wheels because the automobile became a mass product, something that was easily available for anyone. I always try to use Joe Gollumb as an example for my secondary or technical school students. Starting off from a central European agricultural town, he ended up in the world's biggest motorization centre and became one of its top executives. It would have been interesting to see what would have happened without the Hungarian connection in the automotive world because they were such a driving force of technology. Uh, the United States did not have that many um, engineering schools at that time, and there was no doubt that the Hungarian connection of uh, engineers were the driving force in the technology that we have today. Moku was an important trading and agricultural center of the region Dalarfield in the last decades of the 19th century. The town was famous for onion cultivation, and that's what the Ferenc Golom was also dealing with. His wife, Maria Putnoki, gave birth to their second son, Józef, on the 3rd February in 1881. In 1878, there was a smithy founded in Hostel Street. It just opened its gates. This place was opposite the house where Joseph Gollum was living, in the same street, in Hostel Street. When he was running around as a child, he must have seen the smiths forging on the anvil, shoeing horses, fixing carts. They were making different mechanical devices. And maybe, as the steam of the engine inspired the railway men, he was inspired by the vapour of the hot iron. Maybe that made an impact on him. The people of Moko have always been very determined. They wanted to step forward, to make progress. They were willing to run the extra mile, and it was always rewarded. The Golom family was also aware of the fact that you not only need to work hard, but you also need to learn if you want to proceed. The boys, since they were smart and nimble-minded, went on to higher education. Not only did they finish primary and secondary education, his brother, for example, went on to university and became a lawyer. After finishing primary school in Mokol, Joe Gollum also went further and attended the technical school in Seged. Then he went to Budapest to the higher industrial school. He quickly drew his teacher's attention, as he was a rather talented student and was very good at drawing. He drew very clearly, skillfully and transparently. We know his sections and drawing shapes that are so precise and show clearly at first sight, even to a non-technical person, what kind of construction there is on the paper. 
The existing Hungarian school system at the turn of the 19th and 20th century provided a world-class education and world-class knowledge to all of its students. The Hungarian Royal National Higher Industrial School was operating in this building, and Gollum was one of its students. He completed a three-year course here and finished his studies in 1901. It's clear from his school report that he was very single-minded. He was consciously training to be a mechanical engineer, and he was determined to be a machine designer. He took the technical courses related to this very seriously, and his diligence was outstanding. The Higher Industrial School had a training program where, on the one hand, students received a great deal of manual and professional training during the study period. On the other hand, they spent almost the whole summer period working at different industrial plants, taking part in the production. After school, he searched for job opportunities. He worked in the Diosdjör machine factory for a while, then he went to the predecessor of Metripont in Vasharhe, close to Makol, his hometown. This, too, was a small machine factory, but he had a feeling that they were not what he was looking for. And then the company Marta of Arad, the abbreviation stands for Hungarian Automobile PLC Arad. That had car production in mind already at that point and sent him to Germany with the scholarship for six months to go there and take a look at the big car companies. When he heard about the World's Fair, the International Motor Show in the US, he knew he needed to go out there and see it for himself. That's why he actually went to America. He was not thinking of staying there yet. He thought he would go there visit the show and come home afterwards. But when he saw how monumental the car production was there and the bright future it had, he judged the situation and decided straight away to stay in the United States. When you think of the automobile, you, you instantly think of Detroit. In the really early years of the industry, we were behind Europe by 20 years. The car, actually, a lot of people looked at it in the United States as just a fad or something that was passing. It wasn't going to be anything to make a lot of money on. Um, and a lot of the very wealthy people are the only ones that could really afford to buy a car. Your locomobile was your most popular car, and that was a steam car. That took some uh, technology. You had to know what you were doing to operate it. Most of the cars were not simple, so a lot of times you would hire somebody to, to chauffeur your car because you didn't know anything about it. So even the most expensive cars, you usually hired somebody to maintain it. Um, so it was really kind of looked upon as a toy of the rich. What happened is that because of Milwaukee Junction and this location in Detroit, so many people gathered at this location and it really became the mecca or the, the center of the car industry. You had transportation for raw materials there because of the Great Lakes. And you also had a lot of talented people uh, that were living in that area prior to the automotive industry actually taking off. So you had resources and you had talent. Engineers all moved from one company to another company, like they would work at one location for say uh, three, four months, and then they would mo go and work for another company for another three or four months. And they would take their ideas and visions with them and learning things along the way. Particularly with Henry Ford, uh, when he started the Ford Motor Company, that was already his third company. He had failed on the first two, and so his third company, he needed investors. And so instead of going out and finding investors, he would say, look, I'll give you stock in my new company. So he often would go to people and a couple young guys that he went to, he asked them, would you uh, help build engines and transmissions for me? I'll give you stock. Of course, those two young men were the Dodge brothers, years later created Dodge. So they landed in uh, October of 1903 in New York City, being Joe Glom, Mano Fishoff, and my grandfather, Charles Ballow. And they landed in New York City, worked their way over to St. Louis to see the World's Fair. And on the way to and from, they worked at different companies. Some of these companies had nothing to do with his profession. He worked, for example, in a box factory, but he also acted as a mechanical designer there. He gave drawings of a machine he constructed to his manager, saying that this box factory's productivity could be increased a lot with the help of that machine. Joe went to Harris Automatic Press Works in Niles, Ohio, and then came up to see my grandfather in Detroit in 1905 
and ended up getting a job at Ford. He was offered a job at both Cadillac, Northern, and Ford all in the same morning. Ford paid him $2 a week more than the other companies, so Joe came to work here. The next day after reconsidering, he was contacted again by Cadillac and Northern, but by then he'd committed himself to Ford. That's where loyalty came in. I've already agreed to stay here, and he stayed at Ford, even though he was offered more money this time. Joseph Glom was unusual at Ford Motor Company because he had a an academic background. He was technically trained. Most of Ford's workers either were trained as a, under an apprenticeship program or they were self-taught. The technical drawing very clearly shows an engineer's talent and technical know-how, and Ford was absolutely aware of that. And the fact that they both came from a farming background actually could have been a, uh, a link between Galam and Ford. Uh, the interesting thing, of course, is Galam was far better educated than Henry Ford. Uh, Henry quit school at 16 and, and began apprenticing at machine shops and things. He came from a family that basically was dealing with agricultural cultivation. So his first constructions were designed and constructed in a barn. Not only did he construct them, but he also assembled them, put those little mobiles together. He made his success on his own. He wanted to make an automobile, but he wanted something that every man could afford to buy. They could buy a car from a Ford, learn how to drive it, not have to hire a chauffeur, and be able to maintain it themselves and enjoy it themselves. And uh, he decided to build his car. It was the very first Model A, 1903. And that car ran about 950 bucks. And it progressed from there. He made several different vehicles, went through the alphabet, Model A, and Model B, and Model C, um, all the way up until he finally got to Model T. We're here in the Piquette Avenue plant of Ford Motor Company. This was Ford's second plant. It's the first one they actually built as an automobile factory. We're on the third floor, and in this space was what was known as the experimental room. It was walled off, and this is where the Model T Ford was designed and the first prototype was built. It was 1907. Ford Motor Company had been in business since 1903. They'd made a string of cars, different designs, and they had a very successful car called the Model N, and then some variations on that called the Model R and the Model S. And Henry Ford decided that they needed a new car, and he added a letter to it, and it became the Model T. But at the time, it didn't have a name. It was just the next new car. And he went to Joseph Galam, and he said, Joe, I want you to wall off an area on the third floor. Uh, we're going to start building a new car, start designing a new car. Only a few people were allowed in because it was, even within the company, it was kind of a secret project. It was Joe Galam, my grandfather Charles Ballow, and Jules Holtenberger, all three Hungarians who went to school together in Budapest and then ended up being here in Detroit at Paquette and designed the Model T Ford. Within Ford Motor Company, Henry Ford was the guy with the vision, but he recognized that he could not bring that vision to life without all these other people. And one of his great talents was articulating this vision and getting other people to sign on to it and work very hard to achieve that vision. Two of the things that Henry Ford valued in machines were simplicity and lightweight. When they were designing the Model T, it had to be light, and it had to be simple to build, because it would be cheaper to build that way, and simple to maintain, because he was planning on selling it to people who'd never bought a car before. The cheapest car at the time cost $800. Ford wanted the price of the Model T to be under 500. He also wanted the car to be able to run on muddy village roads, and Golomb made it happen by designing extra size wheels in the Model T. Finally, he wanted the car to be technically easy to drive, so easy that even someone with mental disability could be able to drive it. This request was also met, primarily due to the planetary gear designed by Joe Gollum. The man with the ideas was Henry Ford. He had the overall conception of what this car should be. He didn't have all the details worked out in his mind, however, and so he brought his associates in here. They had a Model N in here that they would use as their sort of starting point 
but they would put their ideas on a blackboard. They'd draw them out. And once they all agreed that, say, uh, the transmission or something should look like this, then they'd make a model of it, and they'd see how it worked. Step by step, they'd make the sub-assemblies of the cars, and they would assemble them and test them. Uh, and eventually, what started out as something that was built off the frame of a Model N eventually became a wholly new car. The Model T was finally put on the market on the 1st of October in 1908. There were not any great details of who designed what. It was pretty much a team effort. Of everybody got together and would work on it. Um, Joe is known as doing the majority of work on the transmission, but they all had their hand into some part of it. And uh, they were such a very close group of friends and classmates that they all shared the, the work and helped each other out. They were very stubborn young men, very proud of their knowledge and their ability. Uh, there was an incident in 1908 in which um, Gene Farkas and um, Jules Holtenberger had a very drawn out argument. And at the end of the day, um, it was almost as if it was a duel uh, with words, and they were both fired at that point. Later, Farkas sent a letter to Joe, asking him to intercede for him with Harry Ford. It all depends on you, writes Farkas, because what you want, Ford wants that too. Jules never came back to Ford. He went on to other companies, and Gene Farkas eventually ended up by 1913 coming back to Ford um, and going to work for Ford and stayed the rest of his career at Ford. The biggest problem with the transmission was that due to the inaccurate manufacturing process of the time, connecting and disconnecting drive components laid an extra burden on the gears and other related machine parts. As a result, the transmissions failed very quickly. Gollum solved the problem by designing a gear system based on a planetary principle. In the so-called planetary gear, which in his version consists of external geared wheels only that were much easier to manufacture than the internal geared type. The gears are constantly in connection with each other. This connection was controlled by band brakes, which were easily replaceable wearing parts. He eliminated the role of the clutch in the Model T, say that the car was moving forward and was put in low gear, but the driver changed his mind and wanted to go reverse. All he had to do is step in one pedal, there was no crunching sound, no crackling in the engine compartment, and the car started to slow down and go reverse. I discovered 25 years ago or 30 years ago a letter that my grandfather had written, it actually it was dated on my second birthday, that he remembered test driving a sliding gear transmission instead of the planetary gear transmission. He took the car out on a road test because at that time they tested all the cars on the public streets. And he saw one trolley car pull in to pick up some men at the factory. Then he watched the other trolley car pull in. And then as he was expecting the third trolley car to pull in, he decided to go past and the trolley car turned the other way, pinning him and the prototype Model T against a telegraph pole and destroying the car. And his comment was, oh my God, I'll be fired for this. So he went home all bruised after the wreck, not coming back to the factory, expecting to be fired. And Joe convinced him to come back into work the next day. He came back in the next day expecting to clean out his desk. And Henry Ford's quote to my grandfather was, Charlie, that's the best job you ever did for this company. Because Joe wanted the sliding gear transmission to be dropped and he wanted to produce the planetary gear because that was what was in most of the cars at that time. So because of my grandfather wrecking the prototype of the Model T with a sliding gear, they built 15 million cars with the planetary gear. The planetary gear was a totally revolutionary, innovative solution that can be regarded as the predecessor of today's automatic transmission. One of the most specific characteristics of this transmission was that you could operate the forward and reverse pedal one after the other, so you could make the car swing. Considering the condition of roads back then, most of them were dirt roads or cobblestone roads at best, with this method you could make the car come out of potholes.
there are a few precautionary things you do before you start a Model T. Typically, you wish to uh, make sure that the parking brake is, is on. This lever, all the way back, it locks the rear wheels and puts the car into a parking position. And you want to be sure to retard the spark. You have to control the timing on the engine and you want to give it a little bit of fuel. The next operation is to turn on the ignition and then we can come to the front of the car and actually crank it. Personally, I like the Model T for two reasons. First of all, it is attractive. The other thing is that the construction is so simple that it's very easy to understand how it works. The car is actually mounted on a chassis, and it is the chassis that is loaded, so the body of the car doesn't have to be load-bearing. For that reason, the body was made of wood and was covered with a thin, thin sheet. That's where the name Tin Lizzy came from. The cabin was high, because when designing these cars, it was not the speed or the drag. That was important. They needed to be practical. People were wearing hats at that time, and they were sitting in the car with their hats on, so it determined the height of the vehicle. It is their invention that the cylinder head of the engine can be removed. By that, you could have a direct access to the pistons and to the valve chamber, the inside of the engine. This was a very practical thing, because if something broke, you didn't have to take the whole engine out of the vehicle. And there's the same system in every car we have today. Another thing, the Model T had uh, a suspension system, which was much simpler than typical cars. The Model T had a single spring at the front and the rear. And the suspension was set up so the car was very flexible. You could go over these large holes and bumps in the road and not be so rigid that it would break the car. At the time, the majority of people in the United States were working in the agricultural sector. They had low incomes and there was very little motorization in the area of cargo or passenger transport or even in agriculture. I've been told by some experts on Henry Ford that he didn't want to be a farmer and he uh, would say no man should work harder than a mule and he was very very interested in helping the farmer automate uh, farming in terms of production and moving his materials and stuff. I think that's why he not only wanted to get involved with horseless carriages and also his passion for creating a car that the masses could afford uh, to purchase. He was also very uh, passionate about the Fordson tractors. Ford went to Joe and told him, Joe, spring is coming, the wheat is growing, and we need a lightweight tractor that farmers can harvest with. You've got three days to develop this tractor. Gollum replied, three days is such a short time. But if we take the chassis of the Model B and the engine of the Model N, which is powerful enough, we can assemble a basic version. This little story tells a lot about the personalities of Henry Ford and Joe Gollum, and the quick pace that Ford demanded in planning and developing, and how it was realized by Gollum's engineering ingenuity. He said if I'd asked the people what they wanted, they would have answered that they wanted a better horse and not a car. A car of such category cost $850 at the time. A horse cost around $450, $500. Later, Ford managed to reduce the price, and a Fordson tractor cost less than a horse. He was very interested in helping the working man work harder in a way that was productive and less back work and more head work uh, as he uh, went through the daily chores. Besides passenger transportation, there were other versions of the Model T suitable for cargo transportation and other special tasks. For example, they made fire trucks and snow vehicles out of it. But it could also be used to motorize specific tasks in agriculture. Initially, the farmers themselves made supplementary equipment for this, so that they could use it typically for plowing and harvesting. It was also used as a power source on farms. For example, they would operate water pumps, power generators, and saw machines with it. In extreme cases, it was, for example, transformed into a moving chapel.
the Model T was an extraordinarily important car, arguably the most important automobile of the 20th century. But nearly as important as the car was the production system that Ford Motor Company developed. At the time, it didn't belong to the three criteria Ford formulated at the beginning of the design, but later it became an expectation. The Model T should be designed so that if needed, they'd be able to produce up to one or two million cars per year. But by 1913, he went to all his workers and said, I'm doubling your wages. Instead of $2.50 a week, you're going to get $5 a week. Now, with that $5 a week, I'm going to expect you to work this assembly line. So one person is just doing the steering wheel, and another person is just doing the seats all day long, all week long. The interesting thing is that when they started out making the Model T, they didn't have the assembly line. It wasn't even a glimmer in their eye. All they wanted to do was to make more cars at a lower cost. Someone, and we're not, we're not really sure who, because they weren't writing this down. They were too busy doing to record things. But it appears that someone was inspired by the meatpacking plants in places like Chicago and Cincinnati, where the carcass of a cow or a, a hog would be hung on a conveyor and would move past the meat cutters who would cut off various cuts of meat and, and essentially disassemble the animal. Someone had the idea of saying, what if we turn that around and brought a car past on a conveyor belt and we put parts on? At the beginning, it took about 12 hours to put a car together. With this technological innovation, it could be reduced to almost one and a half hours to 93 minutes. It's not evident to what extent Joe Gollum took part in the design or in the construction of the assembly line, but his indisputable merit in connection with this new method was the car's construction itself that was suitable for this technology. By the time they were working on the line, developing the line, Joe had moved more to be the sort of body and chassis engineer, but Part of that was taking advantage of what the assembly line offered, being able to redesign parts that could be either more easily produced or more easily assembled. So he was an integral part of, of fully utilizing this idea of the assembly line. Over the course of 19 years, the basic version of the Model T remained basically unchanged. When advertising the Model T, Ford would say that the design of the construction was complete. Henry Ford both saw the future and missed the future. Once that future that he saw arrived, and the Model T was a huge success, he then seemed to either not see what the future was or not like the future he saw. Over the course of the Model T's life, from 1908 through 1927, every part was changed in many details. The overall concept of this lightweight, simple car never changed. The Model T Ford had been market leader for over 20 years. Later, the world left it behind. At one point, he had almost 51% of the world market with the Model T. Uh, in turn, other companies started to come in and get into that market, um, such as Chevrolet. Well, what happened is that Henry stayed with the design too long, and other companies were starting to dig into his market share, and he realized that, and then finally, by 1928, had to introduce the Model A Ford, because he was getting left behind. It turned out that the Model T wasn't the ultimate car. It was the baseline car. It was kind of, it turned into, by the early 1920s, it was the minimum that people wanted. Customers began to focus more on luxury and comfort. And here Ford could also make a big step forward. The second Model A, following the Model T, was again a very successful design. And Joe Gollum had an inevitable part of this triumph. One of Henry Ford's talents was recognizing talent in other people. And he recognized talent in Joe Gollum. If he recognized talent in someone, Ford would give them more and more responsibility to see what they could handle. And he did that with Joe Gollum, and it turned out Joe Gollum could handle a lot of responsibility. And he gradually rose uh, very high in the Ford organization. In the Ford Piquette plant, we had quite a few Hungarian workers. And I think what attracted Mr. Ford to them is they were hard workers. 
Ford was aware that when it came to professional issues, such as technology or machine design, that Gollum was way ahead of him. He and Henry Ford managed to work really well together for, for years, for, for decades. If someone had an idea or a question at a business meeting, Ford would usually turn and say, OK, but I need to talk to Joe first. Joe Gallam didn't really have a title because Henry Ford didn't believe in titles and he didn't believe in organization charts. Joe's duties varied over time. There was a period of time after Harold Wills left that Joe was, really was the chief engineer. Gradually, he moved more to be the engineer in charge of body and chassis design. Uh, and by the time he retired, uh, a man named Larry Sheldrick was effectively the chief engineer, regardless of what Henry Ford decided to call him. Not far from the Ford Motor Company's Highland Park plant, there is a house in an impoverished neighborhood that once saw better days. This is the house where Joe Gollum used to live with his wife Dorothy Beckham and their two daughters, Claire and Gloria. I think it was eight years later that he first came back home to visit his family. Afterwards, when he was already a successful engineer and came to Hungary on a regular basis, Gollum would give professional lectures for Hungarian engineers and founded a scholarship for the poor children of Mako, who wouldn't have been able to pay for their education otherwise. He was able to help those still at home in Hungary and his family by supporting them in establishing a new Ford affiliate in Mako. We found an interesting letter he wrote to his elder brother Sándor in 1920. In the letter, he informed his family members that he had sent by ship six Fords and tractors with corresponding plows and additional components, spare parts, and two automobiles. He also wrote in this letter that he would charge his brother Sándor, who was a lawyer, with the foundation of the company. He wanted his older brother to be the technical manager, and regarding his youngest brother, Ferenc, he gave special instructions. Let me read this out loud. Employ him according to your best discretion. If he proves to be hardworking and behaves well, you can make him partner in the company. However, it is of great importance that he must demonstrate that he is able to work and wants to work. I think this properly reflects Joe Gollum's philosophy. The company somehow managed to survive the horrors of the Second World War, but the final push came with the invasion by the Soviet army. Of course, they took all the fuel they could find, as well as all the operable cars and tractors. They took almost everything. And the rest then went on to be nationalized during a period of mass nationalization. In 1915, he became a U.S. citizen, and he married an American lady. Of this marriage, they had two daughters, neither of whom can speak Hungarian. A couple of years ago, we had the opportunity to meet one of his girls. So, on the one hand, it seems that he was fully Americanized. On the other hand, however, it's not true. He stayed in close connection with Hungary and shared his knowledge with Hungarian engineers. He gave lectures at the Technical Association at the time. Moreover, he would show films on the operation of the assembly line. He was always striving to help remotely the people of his home country. He wanted to help in raising the people's living standard, in developing the agriculture, spreading modern cars in the country. In the last 15-20 years, he was not able to visit Hungary due to a heart attack. But not only that, because of the changing in the Hungarian political system, he had no possibility to enter the country. Gilmore Car Museum, uh, we're halfway between Detroit and Chicago. We're out setting of historic buildings, um, but we still draw over 100,000 people here a year. Our primary purpose is to educate. We're an educational institution. Well, how do you do that? In a museum, you tell stories. So we're here to tell stories about the car industry, but not only that, it's about the way cars changed our lives and how we live our lives. 
America has always been a mobile nation. I mean, people came here from other countries and it was this huge place and people, once they got on the East Coast, they moved West and they kept moving West. It's a, it's a place where there's a lot of mobility. The automobile really enhanced that. And, and for Americans, the automobile is wrapped up with the notion of freedom, freedom of movement, um, not having to get on a train or a bus and go on their schedule with all those other people you don't know. I can get in my car and go where I want to go on my schedule. You know, they're no longer stuck at home. I'm no longer stuck on a dead end job. If I want to move somewhere, I can move and I can hop in that car and go. It gave us that freedom. When I was turned 16 years old, okay, uh, having my own car was the most important thing that there was in the world. And it really gave people that freedom. They could travel. That's when we started opening up national parks that people could visit. And people actually did. They hopped in their cars and traveled all over the country because of it. Here in the U.S., a car is a tool that is used every day, especially here in the area of Detroit, where we have almost zero public transportation. If you don't have a car, you can't go to work, you can't go shopping, you can't go anywhere. Because the bus won't come, and even if you walk for a mile, you get nowhere. Here, a car is like a pair of shoes. You need to have it if you want to go anywhere. Uh, people use cars as part of their identity here. And so uh, they take on a real personal sort of presence. Um, just like you would choose what you'd wear every day, uh, that same choice goes into what kind of car you would drive so that people would interpret who you are. American cars were bigger than European cars uh, for a number of reasons. One being simply, it's a bigger country. Uh, we've got a lot of room. We can make wide roads. Uh, we can cut new roads where there weren't any and make them straight lines. We know in Europe and Ireland, I spent quite a bit of time in Ireland, the roads are so narrow and the back roads, the country roads, it, it, it's so difficult. If you have a big car, I don't know how you drive a big car there. For better or worse, Americans tend to like things that are bigger. We eat bigger houses, we eat bigger meals. Most Americans will buy the biggest automobile they can afford. Part of what happened in the, in the 1950s and, and early 1960s is the unique position that America was in. And especially you have to think of the people who bought those cars from the 50s and 60s. These were people who had grown up in the Great Depression. They'd survived the Great Depression. Then they got into World War II. They, they, they survived World War II. They won World War II. They figured life's been kind of difficult for us. Now all that's over. The country's prosperous. We want a reward. We want a big car. We want a car that looks like the future because the future, after a lot of years of not looking very good, the future that we're in now, that future has finally arrived and it's pretty good and tomorrow's gonna be even better. And we want a car that kind of expresses that sense of optimism, that sense of unlimited possibility. And so you get these sort of fantastic looking cars from the 50s and 60s. A kind of car that had never been built before and somewhat sadly probably will never be built again. The American car companies were really asleep at the wheel in the 1970s. What was happening was the Japanese, and Europeans too, Germans specifically, were building better cars, cars that would last a long time. It used to be at one time that a car like this would last maybe uh, 100,000 miles and that was all, or 200,000 kilometers, okay? And they were done. If I could sum up the decline of Detroit, and by which I mean both the industry and the city, in one word, the word would be complacency. People who ran the car industry just got complacent. They thought that the world of the 1950s and 1960s was just gonna go on forever. 
and they didn't think that foreign car competition was very important. Yeah, a few people would buy Volkswagens, but those are funny looking little cars with the engine in the wrong place. And not most Americans don't want those cars. They got complacent about the way they built their cars. The build quality of American cars actually got pretty poor. They didn't anticipate the coming of any kind of pollution rules or safety uh, regulations. They certainly didn't anticipate the coming of the uh, oil embargoes in the 1970s. Uh, and they were completely unprepared for those sorts of changes. Those Japanese cars were smaller, lighter, often simpler. Their quality was high. Their prices were low. Um, and they were in a sharp contrast to some of the big, kind of overpriced, uh, often not very reliable American cars. And so in some ways they were updating the vision that Henry Ford had um, when he and his co-workers were working in this room. Joe Gollum didn't see these lean years. He died on 4 September in 1955 at the age of 74 as retired chief engineer of the Ford Motor Company. After his retirement, he did not terminate his relationship with the Ford Motor Company. He remains active as a consultant. By that time, Ansel Ford, Henry Ford's son, had been leading the company, but yet there was no decision made without him if they wanted to introduce a new construction. In this sense, he remains actively involved in the developing process as a retired person. Joe, Jules, um, Jean, they, they were close, close friends their entire lives. They were always visiting, always sharing ideas, traveling to each other's house. Uh, they were a very close group of loyal friends. If you go to like the Dodge Brothers or Henry Ford or the others, quite often they're large mausoleums. Mm -hmm. But Joe was a common man who the family wanted to be, very common look, I believe. That's the final place where he was laid to rest 60 years ago, 1955. The Paquette plant was saved by a group of private citizens who are very determined to preserve the heritage of the auto industry in Detroit and also to preserve it and interpret it in a way that we can tell the next generation what was accomplished here and what changes took place, what transformation took place in the world as a result of the work that came here. If we play any role at all, it's help connecting not only the residents of Detroit, but the citizens of America to understand that much of the great things that have been accomplished here have happened from the hard work of not only our residents, but our immigrants that have come here with their talents. And I think, I hope, that when we interpret these stories and we talk about Joseph Gollum, that they are inspired um, knowing that they could do the same. They could invent something. They could be part of a team that changes the world. He's the pride of the family of his hometown, Moko, and maybe of the whole world, as his invention, along with his name, is in every technical museum of the world. And maybe this is the reason why I became an engineer. He was a kind of role mother in our family. For my father, it was very important, as he had no possibility to study, to have someone in the family to carry on this tradition. So it was quite obvious from my childhood that I'm going to be an engineer. Here in Moko, it was forbidden to even pronounce their names for more than 50 years. There was complete silence here. I mean, everyone was silent. The old people of Moko knew who Joseph Gollum was. They knew the family members. 
but everybody tried to keep it a secret, not to talk about it in their own interest. It was a most unwanted topic. It was first maybe in the 60s that an article was published on it. The article was published in Népszabadság as an interesting technical historical supplement that a Hungarian man took part in designing the Model T Ford. The first plaque was inaugurated in 1981, on the 100th anniversary of the birth of Joe Gollum. We, the people of Mako, residents of his birthplace, are obliged to take care of his memory. In the museum, there's actually an exhibition and an original Model T to preserve his memory. We owe a lot in this matter to the University of Orboda, the former Bankidona Technical College, which is in the same building where Gollum used to study. In addition to the Nobel Prize-winning scientists, Hungary also gave excellent engineers to the world. Cars are fantastic, they're fun. It's, uh, it's what made you know, the world successful. I mean, before we had the cars, all we had were horses, so it really revolutionized the, the 20th century. It transformed American life. Uh, the Model T helped to break down the isolation of people who lived on farms. Uh, it helped connect farmers to the city and vice versa ultimately spawned the uh, uh, demand for better roads. Uh, but people were driving their Model Ts and they were willing to pay taxes to make the roads better. They needed amenities by the road. Uh, they needed places to stay. Uh, they needed places to eat. Petrochemical industry had to be developed, which made it possible for the vehicle to get petrol for sufficient distances through network of petrol stations, and by that ensuring the operation of the car. And from then on, people describe distances in time instead of kilometers. Now they say that something is 30 minutes away, or a one-hour drive from here. It's not the kilometers that matter, but the time it takes to get there, because there's freeway everywhere. The Model T and other cars enabled people to move out of cities more easily and move into suburbs. You could um, go after a job that you never would dream of going after, because now you had an automobile that could transport you across the country. As important as the Model T, of course, is the production method, mass production, the assembly line. Turns out that could be adapted to lots of things. Radios, phonographs, toasters, refrigerators. It made those kinds of consumer goods cheaper and more readily available. Um, and I haven't even mentioned things like um, air pollution, <laughs> smog, uh, which were unintended consequences. So uh, the, the impact of, of the car that was created right here um, is, is just stunning. And you say that the car industry is declining, but I know from being and growing up here that the car industry is really responsible for so much research and development that has touched all kinds of things in life, like the first artificial heart valve and the, the movie camera and, and hydraulic brakes and refrigerated uh, uh, wagons. And I think that we need to remind our people that we're not just about cars, we're about everything that that research and development touched. When the early guys started making uh, horseless carriages here, they were dreaming about getting people out of the mud and allowing them to travel more than just from work to ho home. But eventually we started doing research into things that put man on the moon. So we like to say that we took man out of the mud and we helped him get to the moon.